Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Hump with Katie. I'm your host, Katie Thoreau, and I have another fantastic episode for you today with the bassist and educator, Tracy Rowell. If you're new to The Hump, this is a series where I interview some of the world's most talented artists and musicians and find out why are they so amazing? How did it all happen? And ultimately, what can we learn from their journey? We've already had some fantastic guests like Larry Grenadier, Christian McBride, Rufus Reed, Paul Ellison, and some amazing non-bassists like Justin Coughlin and Ken Poplowski. You can find all of these episodes and more on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and you can go watch them on YouTube. So go like, subscribe, download, leave a comment, and let me know who you want to hear from next. Before I bring you today's amazing episode, I'd love to thank our sponsors. And first up, we have the clothing company, Jams World. You guys, I absolutely love Jams World. I'm wearing a Jams World right now, of course. And the reason why I love it is because the fabric is made from 100% spun crush rayon, and it keeps me cool and comfortable. They've been making clothing in Honolulu, Hawaii since 1964. And the artwork is so unique. It's screen printed right onto the fabric, and it looks like a piece of art. Go to jamsworld.com and use the promo code Jazz15, and you'll get 15% off your entire online purchase. Next up, I'd like to thank Colstein's String Shop. I absolutely love Colstein's. They are doing amazing things for the bass community. They have two amazing locations in Long Island, New York, and a killer online store. Go to colstein.com and use the promo code KD10 and you'll get 10% off your entire purchase. All right, the time has come to bring you the episode today, and I'm really thrilled to present Tracy Rowell. She's an amazing bassist and educator, and after talking with her, my blood pressure definitely went down. She has such a calming and warm presence. We got to talk all about her formative upbringing in Houston and getting to study extensively with Paul Ellison and then Edwin Barker and her journey as a teacher and a performer, and it was just so much fun. I can't wait for you to hear it. We talked a little bit at the end about the international Society of Bassists. So go check that out. I'm going to leave a link below because they're having an amazing virtual event this year. That's June 8th through 12th. And wherever you are in the world, you can go check it out. So without further ado, here's our guest this week, Tracy Rell. Yeah. Cool. Wow. Tracy, you were like, uh, every once in a while, I'll put out a ping on, on Instagram and see like who people want to get an interview from. And you were like, like number one. Oh, nice. <laughs> well, it's so great. It's great to meet you. I mean, I've heard a lot about you. And uh, so I'm really excited to speak with you. Thanks for joining us on The Hump. Well, thank you. Thank you. I've really enjoyed listening to the episodes that I've heard so far. It's been fun, you know, especially like the cross pollination of like the jazz community and the classical community. And so it's been a lot of fun for me. Uh -huh. Cool. Uh, and I know you're probably just busy and slammed in general, but then teaching online is a whole nother thing, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, this year, uh, I've been lucky that both places that I teach, which is uh, Oberlin College and at the Cleveland Institute of Music, I've actually been able to meet with students in person. Mm -hmm. um, and but in some cases, I'm doing both. So, you know, not only am I dragging my base <laughs> places, but I've got to make sure I've got my computer and my microphones and, uh, you know, um, a lot of my music um, on my iPad so that they, if they're not with me, they can text me a picture or even in the same room, I'm not allowed to touch them or whatever, but. Oh, Were you kind of tech savvy before this or did you have to go in feet first? Um, I would say I was pretty tech savvy, but, but this whole, you know, I think I've learned a lot more about recording and about how, you know, to get a better sound on the instrument online and become a lot more, um, comfortable, you know, making practice recordings of people mm -hmm. or, or for people, you know, I'll demonstrate something and send them a little clip to practice along with or something like that. So I think that it has been a big learning curve. Um, and especially last spring when, when everything happened. So it's a cool skill to have though. I, I just did something with John Clayton the other day and we were, it was a live stream and I got there and he had, he had his mic, he had like a mixing board, like it was like he was a, an engineer. It was incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm probably not to that level, <laughs> but, but I certainly have, you know, have invested in some, some more equipment and, and uh, have learned a lot and, and it'll be interesting to see, you know, when the pandemic is done, you know, what sticks around with us. 
Um, I think it will certainly be easier for students to, you know, take lessons with people that, uh, in remote places from them. So, yeah, definitely. Well, good. Well, today's all about you, Tracy. Um, <laughs> And I, I just kind of, I know you've had some amazing experiences. I'm, uh, I mean, I can't hear enough great things about your teaching uh, and as a mentor, but I, I'd kind of like to know about about your mentors and your teachers and just kind of like um, how, how you got into, I mean, it's so cliche, but how you got into the base in the first place. Well, going way back, um, how I got into the base is, is because of my parents. My, uh, I grew up in Houston and both of my, uh, parents were freelance musicians. Um, and my dad was a band director for a while. And then when I got to be in sixth grade, my mother got a job teaching in the strings department at, in my school district and she needed bass players. So, um, I already played the piano. I had no interest in playing bass and, um, love the piano, but they paid me a, a weekly allowance to show up for class, which at that time was $5. Wow. That's pretty big. <laughs> and then we, <laughs> we re we later renegotiated seven fifty per week if I practiced. So, so that's how I got into it. And my, my father's rationale was if, because my mother took over a, a kind of a failing school system uh, strings department that that if for some reason it 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 bottomed out, I could always just play in the band. <laughs> <laughs> That's so. great. That's kind of funny. I my mom, it was kind of similar. I was too young to be um, recruited, but my sister was the same way. She, she she primarily plays viola, but if she my mom needed an alto player, my sister would have to learn how to play alto. Or, or whatever it was. So I, I missed uh -huh. that. But that's that's funny that you had that same experience as well. Yeah, I was a ringer in the in the strings classroom. <laughs> so when did you actually like playing the bass or did that come later? Um, I think it took a little while. I think the, the beginning class was pretty boring. And I, I told my mother, you know, at the end of one year, I wanted to quit. Um, and I, I think I, I think I knew all of the notes in half in first position and maybe up to D on the G string. And I thought that that was it. I had no idea that, that there was anything else other than that. And, uh, my mom, who was a, a very fine, uh, Eastman trained violinist, she didn't try to convince me otherwise. Um, she just kind of laughed to herself and let me figure it out. And I think I, I eventually went to, you know, an all state or a, you know, summer camp or something like that. And then, and then saw more what the possibilities were when I got to play it in a really good student orchestra. And that's when, that's when it all happened. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so I think, if it, sorry, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, eventually the, they bought me a base and stopped paying me an allowance to practice. <laughs> and um, yeah. So you, you really had to want to do it at that point. Yes. Yep. Um, and I, I started taking lessons with um, someone who was a graduate student at Rice who was studying with Paul Ellison. Mm. And um, eventually, you know, I, I ended up studying with Paul. And it was at the time when he had recently returned from his first, I think he took a year or two, a sabbatical from the Houston Symphony and went to study with Francois Rabath and learned how to play French bow. Um, and so that was a really cool time to be studying with Paul. I had no idea. I just, I just knew he was great and I was happy to be taking lessons with him. Uh, but now looking back, I realize, you know, how lucky that was for me to be there at that time. Yeah, definitely a very interesting point in in the bass world. It was like uh, it was like a renaissance, like just like an awakening. Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember one lesson. I came I came to my lesson, and he said he was playing his first concert with the Houston Symphony, where he was playing overhand bow. I think it was an all French program, so that made a lot of sense to mm. me. That's very cool. Um, people always ask me too, you know, as a young kid about the music you're playing because you're were you playing primarily classical music at that point I mean you're in orchestras and they're always like well how how did you like the music you know there's other things you know pop music of the day did you like playing that repertoire 
Well, you know, the other thing that I did a lot when I was uh, 14 or 15 years old is um, at that time in Houston, there was a there was a jazz band. It was a reading band uh, that met every Wednesday night at the at the union local. And um, there was this older gentleman named Hal Tennyson, who um, he was a saxophone player, but he he is someone who then was kind of a um, someone that people looked up to, and he had played way back in the day with really famous people. And so it was a it was a place where you could show up, and and the and the band just read mm -hmm. repertoire and got to know it. And I think that was a really great formative experience for me. Um, you know, because a lot of the parts were written out, a lot of it was big band material, but I had to learn how to walk a baseline and do a little improvisation. And so I think there was that component. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, before I ever did any uh, classical orchestra gigs in Houston, um, I was playing jazz gigs already and oh, you know, cool. little electric bass and stuff like that. So not, uh, not too many people know that anymore because I, I think eventually I had to focus on in one direction, but, but, uh, you know, I feel like that was a really great, uh, foundation for me. Yeah, it definitely, um, keeps you on your toes. Yeah, yeah definitely. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Um, so, and then with Paul, I, I, um, I was, I think he used to say I was kind of like an experiment because I think I was maybe the first student that, you know, I, um, this is before there were the George Vance or the Suzuki method books or anything like that. So I think, you know, probably earlier pupils, uh, probably studied, you know, Samandel and Stortrabe etudes and stuff like that. But, um, I mean, I did Samandel, but but Paul used all the Raboth materials with me. So I think I was one of his first younger students to go through all that, uh, all that material. And so that was super cool. And in fact, I think I really enjoyed practicing that a lot more than some of the other etudes out there. <laughs> yeah. Um, did you study with Paul before you went to Rice? I did. I did. I studied with him, um, I think, starting my sophomore year in high school. And I was with him for two years. And then I went to Interlochen Arts Academy. And so I was away from him for that year. And then I and then I came back to Rice. And I was actually there for, for four and a half years. So I have I have a student at Interlochen now. What is that? What is that like, to, you know, to be in that? I feel like it's such a um, I don't know. Just like a snow globe in a good way of just like these talented focused people that are your age what was that experience like for you yeah um well it was it was pretty cool um you know i think it was a it was a year when it took away some of the extra things that i had to do in my you know in my regular in my public high school back in texas and it really allowed me to focus on music and i really enjoyed being with people that were more like myself. So I didn't feel kind of like the oddball. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that was really motivating. And I think it really helped, helped me get ready for, for college, you know, being a little more independent and living away from home. Um, and there's a family history there too, because my mom was part of the, uh, the graduating class of the very first year of Interlochen Arts Academy. Wow. And when I went there, I was the first um son or daughter of of a graduate to attend the interlochen arts academy wow yeah that's some deep history <laughs> that's very cool uh were you and like an incessant practicer as well at that time uh i think i was trying to be i think i was trying to be and i was pretty disciplined um you know i had i had been playing piano for a long time um before i started bass and i think that I, I think that was the main reason why i wanted to go to interlochen is so that i could really focus on my practicing mm -hmm. so. yeah uh, it's an intense an intense but a nice place to be where you like you said it's like you can just focus on on this yeah that's great yeah, um did you know so you obviously kind of knew like I want to do this. This is this is my path. Did you know how you wanted to do it? Like, 
was it a question like I want to be in an orchestra I want to be a soloist I want to be a teacher did you have a clue at that point well I think by the time I got to Rice I was very focused on becoming an orchestral musician mm -hmm. and um, that was that was the focus and I think I spent a lot of time a lot of energy trying to make that happen and also had a lot of anxiety about whether I was going to be able to make that happen. Um, you know, I think that, you know, having grown up with musician parents, I was really aware of um, how hard they worked all the time as, as freelance musicians and also hearing about their background and stories. Um, so I, I, the work ethic was there. I, I knew that, that it was all about, all about that. Mm -hmm. But um and you know, eventually, I did get it. Um, I was I used to be assistant principal bass of the National Art Center Orchestra up That's in right. Ottawa, and so it took a few years. It took I went to grad school, and I don't know if you want to hear about that later, but but so I did eventually get the job. But mm. one super formative thing happened to me when I was at Rice, which kind of changed everything about how I thought about everything actually just that I had a huge playing injury um and didn't play the bass for about nine months my sophomore year wow and uh as far as I can tell um it was it was in my left hand and um I I had I basically like injured a nerve point and it would never stop hurting when I put my index finger down mm -hmm. and you know I went to doctors I went to physical therapy I did yoga I did acupuncture mm -hmm. <laughs> um I went to someone who uh, specialized in musician injuries who was about to suggest that they do exploratory surgery on my on the index finger. And uh, okay. if I'd had my calendar with me in that meeting, I would have scheduled the surgery and done it. But luckily, I didn't. I went home and I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. And um, ev eventually, I recovered from the injury and started to started to play again. Um, but, you know, I, I think if that was, you know, I think I learned a lot um you know was kind of forced into learning a lot through that process did you have to relearn a different technique of playing so you wouldn't injure yourself again well i did i did i think first of all you know during that year i used to go to my lessons and you know cry or <laughs> whatever and paul would pat me on the back and he would say well let's work on your bow arm and mm -hmm. uh he gave me these exercises to do that were mostly you know open strings and um different bow strokes and understanding the curvature of the bridge and different s curves uh, um you know things like that and you know with slurs with separate bowing and so i would practice that and it would take me about a half an hour per day and i i i would you know i just didn't feel like i was making any progress whatsoever and it was really frustrating um and then when i was able to start playing again it turns out that all that work that i did on the bow where i felt like i wasn't doing anything actually might have improved my playing overall in the long term um, in a way where it wouldn't have ha it wouldn't have occurred because I wouldn't have been patient enough to pay attention mm -hmm. that much to my bow arm. Um, and so I think that was the that was the big lesson that I learned and it took a while after I started playing again to really discover that. but I remember you know playing in studio class for the first time after that and Paul was like, you know just, he was really surprised. <laughs> um, but yes, I, I was um, I was really careful when I started playing with both hands to be really aware of everything that I was doing um, and to go slowly and to take my time with things um, so that so that I wouldn't re-injure myself. And I, I think in the long run, it's really it's really helped my playing overall. Um, and and yeah. and. Yeah, maybe maybe helps me, you know, along my path for for teaching too. Mm -hmm. So, well, I think it's important. I won't harp on the injury the whole time, but uh, you know, some people play until it hurts, and then they don't realize that they're just making things worse and worse until you just can't play anymore. So, was it the type of thing where you were just playing through it at first, and then 
or was it just like an immediate like ouch what is happening well i think you know the work ethic that i had i was practicing a lot of hours per day and probably just you know just pushing it past where i where i should have been and not not paying attention to my body and realizing i needed to rest and stuff like that and it was that was a hard lesson to learn mm -hmm. that that uh, of course we need to practice for hours a day but but practicing smarter practice rather than practicing harder you'll get more done in most cases so yeah that's so important i think for people to hear practicing smarter rather than harder yeah that's great i'm i'm like massaging my arm as you're talking i'm <laughs> like a phantom uh pain here oh that's great and uh it must have just felt so good to play again oh yeah yeah i think that my um perspective was changed too because i was just so grateful to be able to play and so happy and i think not being able to do it and you know entertaining other possibilities was i supposed to do something else and not really having a clear path in another direction um you know that when i started to play again i i think i was i think i had a a, a much better attitude about it in general yeah that's what you're supposed to be doing yeah yeah i i kind of felt at peace that was what i was supposed to be doing and um it probably enjoyed it more yeah um and had you know kind of a you know a better perspective you know experiencing some hard knocks and then and then having this great thing which is you know it's like a toy in your hand something beautiful to, mm -hmm. to do something challenging for your mind and your body yeah so, you know yeah i love that um what was your experience at Rice? I mean, do you mind me asking like what years you were there? Um, I graduated in 1991. Okay. And that was during the time when uh, they were building the new building, which mm -hmm. now is no longer new. <laughs> I think they've built another uh, beautiful building. Um, but so for the last year that I was on campus, uh, we were able to use all the, the, uh, practice rooms and, um, we had the, the base studio ballroom available to us. That was this huge studio at where Paul's studio still is. It's really beautiful. It has all these windows. And I experienced the before, which was down in the basement of a, of a building mm -hmm. and we all used to you know sit on the floor for studio class and you know we're breathing up the person's nose <laughs> while they were playing in class yeah. and so and so that was really exciting to see you know the kind of um the the wonderful facilities that they have now being being developed so and what, um, was, what was like was it a what was the camaraderie like of the base studio well, I think there was always a really good camaraderie. Um, I, I, I really feel, you know, the, the person, the teacher who's in charge kind of sets the tone for how that, how that's going to go. But, but I had a, a really wonderful group of, of, of colleagues and some of whom I'm still in touch with. Um, you know, I was there uh, my freshman year, um, Jose Deschen and Sebastian Dubé were graduate students um and i'm trying to jonathan m sandy he's in the uh he's out in arizona now um ken harper was in that class um it was anna Cohn, <laughs> where i'm still in touch with all these people you know a couple of them just on social media but but um you know it was it was a really good vibe and the and we helped each other um you know, I didn't realize that that women should encounter any difficulties in the base world because mm -hmm. I had two other colleagues there with me, and and um, it was kind of a non-issue. Mm -hmm. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know this is a huge question, but what what are some great takeaways or lessons or experiences from working with Paul Allison for so many years? You know, I just feel really fortunate that that I had, you know, all that time with him um, because I I did have the time in high school. Then I and then I spent an extra semester at Rice um, after my injury. Um, and 
you know, I, I'm, I, for a while I, you know, went off on my professional world, but I, but I still speak with him regularly now. And, um, I just feel like he's a really good mentor. Um, and I think he's, he's really someone who, who helps people find their own path. So when, when I was a student, I would, you know, try to ask him questions and he would answer me with a question. And, and sometimes at that time, it probably went over my head or I didn't get it. But I realized now that he was helping me to, even though he knew the answer to my question, that it was more important for me to process that and find out the answer myself mm -hmm. um, is, uh, to, to, to make it experiential in a way that that's different from if somebody just tells you the answer and you write it down and, and try and figure it out that way. Um, so I just feel like he has a lot of, a lot of wisdom like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and of course he was all over, you know, my learning the hard way to, to practice smarter, not harder. Um, you know, I think awareness is a big thing. Um, being, being aware of, of what you're doing with physically, mm -hmm. um, you know, and not just, ju not just, you know, blindly going into the practice room and, and pounding on your base. Yeah. I'd say those are, those are some of my big takeaways. I could probably go on and on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, that's great. Um, did you go directly to then Boston University after that for your master's? I did. I did. Um, so, yeah, I, I graduated from Rice and and remember, you know, driving away <laughs> in my Toyota Tercel hatchback, which is a which they don't make anymore. No, but they don't. just to put it in perspective, it's about the size of a Honda Fit, but not quite as roomy. <laughs> and um, so I had everything that I needed for my entire life stuffed into that car. And, you know, I think the base was sitting on top of my suitcase and I had a, you know, a stereo in there somewhere and drove from Houston to Boston, picked up a friend along the way and was lucky enough to spend the summer at Tanglewood mm. um, that summer um, before, before, you know, starting at BU with, with Ed Barker. And was that the reason why you wanted to go to do your master's to study with him? Yeah, I think at that time I I was really wanting to polish, um, you know, all of my orchestral rep and and really prepare for orchestral auditions, mm -hmm. and and that was specifically why I went was to was to study with with Ed. Mm -hmm. And how how is um, can I talk about with this? I talk about this with people too, you know continuing to go to school and the reasons why how is how is doing your master's different than your undergrad for you i think you know uh my undergrad training uh you know between the injury and and you know being at the university and having to take other academic classes at rice was more general mm -hmm. in my study and and that i really was able to focus in on one direction Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that was probably the time that I stopped playing electric bass and other things like that, because I knew that for a little while I need to put all my eggs in one basket if I was going to get ready. Mm -hmm. So, so I think I had more time to practice. I had uh, fewer classes that I need to take and, um, you know, that, 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 that was really good. And so I also knew that, you know, being in school was only for going to be for a couple of years and I need to put my money where my mouth was as mm -hmm. far as, you know, all the, all the things that, that you need to do as far as being disciplined and organized and, and, um, you know, putting, you know, get, getting your performance ready to, to stick with you when you're under pressure and can pull it out of your back pocket mm -hmm. in an audition. So, yeah, that's very true. Yeah. I feel like grad school, uh, the good ones in, in a good way, it's like you're left to your own devices. Almost you have, yeah. you have your teacher, you have like maybe just a couple classes that you got to get done, but it's really you focus time. Yes. Exactly. And at that time where you, uh, were there opportunities of, of playing in Boston, you know, even just little chamber things. There were, there were, I, um, I think I got there at a good time and, um, there are a couple of people in the, the Boston, I think still has a pretty good freelance scene, but, but back then I think it was maybe even more, 
Um, and there are a couple of people who had just moved out of town. And so I was very fortunate uh, to start working right away. Hmm. Um, and, you know, I think eventually uh, I was, you know, subbing with the Boston Pops Esplanade Orchestra and some with the Boston Pops and got to do a little work with the Boston Symphony before before I left town. So it's incredible. So yeah, it was it was really it was really an amazing experience. And so um, and one of my favorite places that I used to uh, play where I felt like it was a great musical education too is at Emanuel Church, um, where even now it's the only place that I know of other than Leipzig where they do a Bach cantata every week as part of the church calendar within the within the, the liturgy of the, the the church service every Sunday. And so that was a that was a great uh, learning experience. Mm -hmm. You know, playing continuum, I feel like is it's like uh, you know, you've gone outside and you've gotten muddy and you need to go <laughs> inside and take a really hot shower with strong soap. Yeah. <laughs> like every everything that you play is really audible and you have to, you know, make something musical with the cellist and and blend into, mm. you know, the continuo line. And I, I still love to do that whenever I have the chance. So mm. and, and up up until, you know, this point, you, you kind of mentioned it, whoops, briefly. Um had you experienced any prejudice in you know in your community from being a, a female at all it was just it just was what it was I, you know i think nowadays the discussion about that is a lot more out in the open um in general i think people are more willing to talk about it and it's not that i didn't experience prejudice but looking back on it i think it was just so part of the culture um in, especially in texas that it wasn't that it was any worse at music school but it just mm -hmm. was everywhere and it's something that you had to deal with and so i think i just didn't deal with it i think i just just you know tried to work as hard as i could and and um hunker down and and you know i figure you know you're supposed to get an orchestra job based on what you sound like um now I know that the world is not always perfect and things don't don't always work out the way that they should. Um, that's not to say that, you know, I feel like I was ever, ever mistreated, you know, professionally, especially not back then. Um, but, you know, that's basically how I how I dealt with it. You know, people used to say, you know, what, what's a little girl like you doing with a big <laughs> instrument like that and, you know, stuff like that. And and I I would feel, you know, annoyed or smile or laugh and just try to brush it off and stay focused on what I needed to do so yeah because that's I mean ultimately no matter what happens you know if there's any sort of prejudice just, it's just about the music and how how you feel about it yeah. so well I I feel very fortunate because the two big mentors that I had uh, both Paul and Ed you know that was a complete non-issue mm -hmm. in either one of their studios i feel like they were ex extremely supportive both of them and that i i didn't really feel any um any repercussions from being from being female during my studies so so after you finish boston university what what happened what was your plan were you were you actively taking auditions while you were there or did you wait I started to take auditions. Um, I think I was a senior uh, at Rice and I took my first audition. And then, you know, I knew from that experience, I, it gave me a good idea that I wasn't quite ready and what I needed to do. And then I started taking auditions during grad school. And uh, my second year in grad school, um, there was a Boston Symphony audition. And um, you know, I didn't have any professional experience, so I was in the the pool where you get asked to make a a pre-screen recording. And back then, it was the the AF the American Federation of Musicians had a a specified list that you would do. And so I I made that recording and worked really hard. So I you know each step along the way, my my only goal was I just wanted to get through the next round. So, you know, so I made so the recording. All audio, audio recording or video? It was an audio recording. Mm -hmm. So, 
Um, so I worked really hard on those excerpts and got them, you know, up to the level. And, and I was pleasantly surprised to find out that I got through that round. And then I thought, oh, wow, that means I have to prepare for the preliminary round. And back then, um, they didn't, it, for the for the BSO audition anyway, they didn't specify excerpts. So they would snail mail you a list and on one piece of paper, but it was like, you know, super long and it was complete pieces. And, you know, so then you didn't, I didn't know what it was going to be. Yeah, so I had to start preparing this big list and um, went to the preliminary round and come to find out, you know, I was surprised to find out I made it to the semis. <laughs> That's awesome. And so and at the beginning of the process, you know, I, I think I remember having a conversation with Ed and saying, well, I, I think that I'd like to, to do the Boston Symphony audition. He said, great. He said, you know, you're probably not going to win the audition. I said, I know I, I'm, I might, I might not be ready, but I, but I want to work hard and see, you know, how much I can improve for the process. Mm. And so I think we were both surprised, you know, that eventually I ended up in the, in the semifinals. And I think maybe I was a vote one or two votes from the finals in the end. So that, that was a really encouraging process for me to go through. And I think I was really, really focused on that. And it helped me to then win the audition that I did, you know, a few months later. Which was for which uh, company? That that was for, um, so I was the, it was for the National Arts Center okay. Orchestra in Ottawa, and it was for assistant principal bass. Mm -hmm. oh. It's just amazing. And and because you, you did at least, it was one live audition for the BSO or two? Uh, two live auditions. Mm -hmm. And are oh. you, are you a good auditioner? Are you nervous? Are you? Oh, I'm, I'm very nervous, very nervous. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so I had a few other experiences too, where I went to places and didn't play my best. Um, and, you know, hard on myself, all that stuff. Uh, um, so. But boy, what a learning experience. It was a learning experience. It was a learning experience to be sure. So. Yeah, and an opportunity to uh, to just prepare all that music. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I I tried not to have my like whole life depend on the results of the audition. Mm -hmm. I think that having a goal in mind, like I'm going to try to play my best <laughs> on this audition day and and whatever happens is kind of what's supposed to happen and you know if you win the audition great if you don't win then then fine and so i cry i tried to to um have a little bit of perspective that way just knowing that you know maybe if it wasn't supposed to work out this time then something better might work out later so mm -hmm. and like you said you were you were probably a lot more prepared for the next audition you took that you won. I, I was. I think that sometimes, um, you know, things where you where you haven't maybe won the audition or been as successful as you as you wanted to, actually are do build up successes over time because uh, it's like um, every performance and all the practicing you've done in the past kind of snowballs and kind of gives you a foundation for the future, you know, whatever, whatever performance you're, you're preparing for. And yeah. I feel like the, the whole thing makes you better. Yeah, it's it, cumulative. It's cumulative, you know, but there is a, a lot of, uh, um, there are a lot of no's and a lot of, there's a lot of rejection in this business to be sure. And so, you know, being able to, to have a little bit of perspective, um, you know, th even when there are disappointments, I think is, is something that I'm sure that a lot of people are familiar with. So. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but were your parents just kind of thrilled for you, like in your success up to that point? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I remember calling my dad and, uh, you know, telling him that, that, you know, I was off the payroll and uh, he went out and bought himself a new car. <laughs> <laughs> I called the next day and uh, my mom said, well, you know, he just went down to 
the Toyota dealership and he's looking at a truck. <laughs> so yeah, they were pretty proud. That's awesome. Um, so when you took the position at in Ottawa, was that did you have to move there? Or was that you could a traveling position? I had to move there. Okay. And and actually, concurrent with this audition, uh, I had, you know, a bunch of big life events happen at this kind of simultaneously. So, so yeah, I, I, I won an audition. I won that audition two and a half weeks before I got married. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and we both actually moved up to Ottawa and started in the National Arts Center Orchestra at the same time. Oh, wow. So, yeah. That's amazing. And uh, how long were you there for? We were there for three years, mm -hmm. um, during which time we had two children. <laughs> so, wow. yeah, so there was a, a lot of things going on. It, it, I think uh, a friend, uh, one of my roommates from Rice is a psychologist, and she she showed me a list of life events and, and, and stressors, Stress, things yeah. that stress you out. And um, at the top are new job, moving, moving to a different culture, <laughs> and kids. different life status, and having children all happen. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. So, well, did you? Was it something that you just you were in it and you did it and you look back and you go, how did I do that? Or was it? Did it feel stressful at the time? I I think it was just I. It was so many good things were going on. It it didn't. I don't think that that the stress really bothered me mm -hmm. um, as much as as you know different kinds of stress that I might have nowadays. You know, because it was just all all good and all all joyful. Mm -hmm. um, and there were some some things that were that were hard too. Mm -hmm. um, so, was the orchestra um, a different atmosphere? You know, just being in Canada, or was it? kind of what you had expected well it was great um you know that's a really sweet sweet gig and uh you know i feel very fortunate to have spent time with that ensemble um and they're doing great now when we were there it was a really tough time for the orchestra mm. um they were you know, we we're on the verge of going on strike and, you know, for, I think for pretty much the whole time that we were there, there was, well, I remember when, when I moved up there, I thought, oh, great. You know, they, the, um, as opposed to in the U S where the orchestras are not for profits and, and so you're dependent on somebody fundraising to make the organization run. I thought, oh, great. This, this orchestra is, is government supported. And so I won't have to worry about that wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's just a different kind of 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 uh, of thing that you have to do. Yeah. So so it was it was really a tough time for for the orchestra um, while we were there. So. But you made it. We made it. We made it. So you know we 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 you know we're very much. Um, you know we learned all about orchestra committees and you know, unions and, um, you know, speaking up for ourselves, um, promoting um, the public image of the musicians to the community, uh, community engagement. Because you, you know, have to that. tell, you have to, in a nonverbal way, tell people why they need this, right? Well, just kind of remind them that, you know, we're, we're people just like everybody else and, and we contribute to the communities that we're in and, um, you know, the, the, we're not necessarily just feeling entitled, <laughs> but I think it's, I think it's good to remind people, you know, that it's okay to enjoy the job that you have, uh, if it's in the arts and that, it, that it's, you know that it might be just as necessary as as other kinds of jobs that might be out there too. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. imagine how imagine how miserable this pandemic would have been without the arts. <laughs> oh my gosh, I know. Yeah. Every form of art, yeah, we would have become mush. Our brains would have become mush. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, obviously, you left that position what what came next for you after that 
Well, um, you know, you talk about life choices and, and things, you know, so I worked really, really hard to get that gig that I really, really wanted and got, and I was grateful for it. Well, what happens when your spouse gets a, a more, it gets a, gets a better job. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, so we moved to Cleveland, Henry got in the Cleveland orchestra and we took a year's leave of absence during which time, you know, um, I think I had to let them know when during the month of December, we'd barely moved there um, and seen what it was like. So it was before he had tenure and, and, and things like that. And we had kids. So it was really hard to think about being in two different places. Mm -hmm. So, so I kind of had to take a leap of faith that it was going to work out somehow. Um, so I ended up leaving that job and, and kind of going off into unknown, unknown territory. You had, you had nothing lined up. Well, there was freelancing here in Cleveland, and um, right when I moved to town, there was an audition for the Canton Symphony, which is um, about an hour away from Cleveland, which which actually is a really good regional orchestra. And so I was fortunate to get that principal bass position in that orchestra. So, and uh, I did some playing with Apollo's Fire, which is a period instrument group right away. So, so I think for Cleveland being a smaller town and having less freelancing in general than either Boston or Houston, that, that, that I was very fortunate to have some opportunities right away. But, but certainly this was not, you know, full time at the, at the time. So, well, yeah, cause you have two smallish children as well. Exactly. Exactly. So, wow. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that is a leap of faith, but then, um, I mean, maybe we're fast forwarding a little bit, but I mean, you're known as, and you are a fantastic educator and, and teacher and mentor. So when, when did you start teaching? Did you, was it something you liked to do or you just kind of fell into it? Well, you know, the, the first teaching gig I had actually was back in Houston. Um, I, I mentioned, uh, you know, my extra time that I had at Rice, I think, um, somebody had called up Paul and said, Hey, you know, do you have any students that would be good for teaching? We, you know, my middle school and high school students. And it was a, a school system in Houston that had, um, had a lot of numbers, a really good, good program. So, so, you know, I didn't realize it at the time, but, you know, so it was my first teaching gig of teaching private lessons. And I would show up at the school and there were nine students there for me. So that was, that was incredible. And, and, you know, I tried to teach them the best that I could. And I remember going in and telling Paul, Hey, they all made the region orchestra. And he was like, Hmm. Yeah. And I, I, but I, I didn't really care about it then. I didn't, I saw, cause my parents were teachers. I, I saw how hard they were working and, and, and thought that looked like too, too difficult for me. I was, I didn't, I just was focused on performing then. So fast forward to um, Cleveland, um, I think I accidentally got um, recommended. <laughs> I wasn't looking for anything. And then I started to get a couple students and then it turned into a few more students. And so that was enjoyable. But, but I'd say one, one big thing, which really turned me on to teaching was that George Vance uh, asked me to be on his summer base faculty um, for for some for my first summer and that was really when um i started to fall in love with teaching as an as an art form and really as a way to connect with people and not necessarily to try to make everyone into a professional bassist but but to really help somebody on their journey of of learning and discovery and finding mm -hmm. something, something beautiful in the in the process so. yeah because it, it takes a special kind of mindset like you said, it's like, uh, you know, obviously you're not trying to make, you, you can read somebody pretty well right away. Like you're not trying to make them the best soloist or the best something. You just want to help, help them feel better and Im kind of improve what they're, what they're already doing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was just, it was amazing. Um, and then, you know, besides the time that we spent teaching and being with the students, there was also a faculty hang. Um, and so it was, you know, after lunch, um, 
I don't know, I think the students were having bass orchestra then or something like that. And we all would sit around on the stage and it was Francois Robath and it was George and it was, I think Rufus Reed was there one year and uh, a couple few years. Um, you know, it was, and, and just being able to really spend time around, you know, all these wonderful human beings and, and it's kind of infectious, the, the kind of uh, passion they have for yeah. teaching and, and performing and, and learning in general. Um, I think it was important for me to see somebody like Francois Rabath, who he now, this is years later, he's still 90 and he's still, pra he's, he's practicing, he's writing music. Mm -hmm. And so, and so it, it, it let me know back then that, you know, I had left a, a one career path, but there was, um, there was, there could still be a lot in front of me and a lot of really cool things out there that I hadn't really been thinking about too much before. Mm. So that's where I met, you know, people like Lloyd Goldstein and Hans Sturm, and Johnny Hamill, people that, that, um, you know, there's fantastic teachers and players and, and, and all of the, the faculty in that festival uh, in Georgia's camp had to play a half recital. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was cool to, to be able to, to present a recital and challenging to me, but also just, you know, to celebrate everyone else. And it was, a, you know, very supportive atmosphere. Oh, so. I wish I could have seen that. It's funny. I, I I've wondered like an, my own cartoon strip in my head, like when bass players hang out, it always just seems like fun and supportive. And I've always kind of imagined what like a violin hang would be sometimes because it's really cool like you mentioned Rufus Reed and Francois Robot when you see people of that caliber and that level going like how did you do that oh man like you know talking about all this stuff and like not only are they vulnerable but they're still so interested in the bass and in the music and you think they've been playing for 50 or 60 years uh and there's still more and it that's really inspiring to see to see that yeah exactly that's uh it's uh, that it's about the process mm -hmm. and 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 i i too i find that to be really in inspiring and so so you know each time i got to go teach at that place i found that that i came back probably with more than i than i thought that i had to give and so mm -hmm. and so it kept me going for a while afterwards so mm, that's great uh and then of course, now you're at Oberlin. Um, did you fall into that as well? Or is that something that you, you really wanted to do? Um, you know, it just kind of happened, but um, it happened after I'd been here for a while. Um, and I think, you know, um, I had kind of given up on a lot of things um, and had moved into this area where um, you know, I remember sitting with my daughter in a Suzuki cello lesson at the Cleveland Institute of Music, and she's, you know, four years old and learning how to play twinkle in D major. And, and I'm thinking this would work just brilliantly on the bass. Why aren't more people doing this? And um, George actually um, put some little tiny basses on Greyhound <laughs> and sent them up here so that I could start a uh, a, a program of little basis in the Suzuki program at, at CIM. Mm. And I think, you know, it's interesting that I feel like I learned a lot about teaching in general, um, from teaching children, um, how to hold the base, how to, cause it's, it's great. You can get somebody before they have any bad habits, you can mm -hmm. set them up, you can teach them. You can be the first person to, sh to put the bow into their hand. You can, help them to make a sound that's resonant from the first time they put the bow on the string. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's, it's incredible. And, and this is what I was seeing with, you know, with my, with my kids in their lessons. And so I, I, I think that I, I spent a number of years doing that and, um, you know, teaching, you know, up through middle school and high school and things like that. Um, and, you know, I think just eventually, I think I've been teaching at Oberlin, since 2012 now, um, and and love teaching, you know, all the ages from you know beyond college down to little kid, and find find them all to be um, exhilarating and challenging. And it's interesting that 
I have noticed through the years that that some of the older students are dealing with some of the same issues that the that the younger students have. So so it's a matter of spinning mm -hmm. uh, that information um, in a way where the the different somebody from a different age and stage can can hear what you have to say. Um, you know that's been kind of a a, a journey for me these last few years trying to learn as much as I can about about different teaching styles and awarenesses so that so that um, I can connect with with someone wherever they are. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that's that's very important. Yeah. Um, don't want, I'm not gonna take up too much more of your time, but <laughs> you're very active in the base community, you know, with ISB mm -hmm. and, and other workshops, but also um, if I it's talk a little bit about you got to spend uh, you got a grant to study with Verbot a few years ago? Yeah. So the first time I met Francois, I was 15 and studying with Paul. And I think it was the first time he came to Houston. And I'd seen him at the George Vance camp and spent time with him. But I, I never got to actually go study with him until a few years ago, where I, I applied for a grant through Oberlin College and got to go, got to go study with him. And that was fantastic. Um, you know, I, I spent a few months preparing a lot of his material as well as some solo Bach and other things. And it was great to be the student again. And, and it was, you know, good for, I feel like it was good for my playing. It was inspiring for me to spend time with, you know, this person who is much older than I am, who is still learning as we, as we mentioned. And, uh, you know, I just, loved being in a different country it was it was yeah, a real, how, how long real. were you there for you were in in france i well you know the there are two parts to that trip one was um so the whole thing took about a month and i spent um a couple of weeks with caroline emery mm. um so i stayed with her and i basically went to work with her and shadowed her and observed her teaching for a week or and two where, where does she teach she teaches, well, she's in the London area and she teaches at the Royal College of Music, okay. as well as the Yehudi Menuhin School and Eton College. Um, so it's, that was, that was really interesting. And she, she has a connection with, with Rabath too. So then after, our, after that time with Caroline, I went to Francois for two weeks. Mm -hmm. So. Wow. What an experience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably inspiring when you came back to your own teaching studio. Yeah, it was, it was, um, I, you know, it was great to remember what it's like to be a student, you know, when somebody is, because I felt like he was just giving me information and mm -hmm. he was playing stuff. I had to play it back for him and just, you know, having to be really on. And, and I think a lot of the teaching that I usually do is by ear. Like he likes to teach by ear, not necessarily by using written music. And mm -hmm. so it was good for me to remember what I'm asking my own students to do mm -hmm. in that case. Um, it was great to have to prepare some new material for me and I got to come back and, you know, did it in some faculty concerts at summer camps and things like that. And uh, Caroline is, is uh, you know, she's also amazing. She's been teaching all the ages for a really long time um, and has written her own materials. And it was great for me to learn more about, you know, how she goes about things um, and some of the different repertoire that, that what they're using over in Europe that, mm. that I don't see as much in this country. So, yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. What an experience. Um, well, Tracy, I, I'm, I'm going to not take up any more of your time. I really appreciate you taking the time. And uh, I just feel so lucky to get to speak with you. And I know our fans are going to be very happy because they all wanted to hear from you. So I'm glad we got to make this happen. Well, thank you so much for for asking me. Um, and, uh, you know, this felt like just sitting down and talking to one of my friends and I look forward to being together in, in person and, 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 you know, continuing the conversation. Yeah. I hope to see you at an, at an ISB in person one day. I hope so. Yeah. I hope. Oh, I, I know I was going to ask you anything, anything on the docket, anything coming up that, that, that we should be aware of. 
Well, the ISB uh, virtual convention is coming up um, June 8th through 12th, and um, they've made it very affordable, um, you know, since, we, you know, we're kind of coming out of this pandemic now, we hope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, and I, um, I think it's gonna, it's not going to be the same as being able to go out to a restaurant with all of your friends, um, after the headliners concert, but there will be social events. Um, and I, I know that, that it's going to be, um, almost as inspiring as being there in person, mm -hmm. uh, but very affordable and maybe, maybe more convenient in some ways. Um, so the, there are going to be recitals, there are going to be classes, there's going to be, there are going to be some, some panel discussions. I'm going to be involved in one that's uh, uh, from, with the Project for All Gender Equality, which is something I've been involved with since being on the ISB board. And uh, Maggie Cox and a few, a few friends have put that together. And I, um, I don't know. I don't think I should speak to all all who's going to be on the the panel, but I think it's going to be, you know, a place where where people could come and ask questions and and chat about you know uh, what it's like being not male in the base community. Mm -hmm. uh, so so that's part of the more open discussion that's happening these days, which I'm really happy about. And I think there's going to be a similar panel uh, talking about diversity as well. So. Uh, as long as well as all the general headliners, uh, mm -hmm. classical and uh, jazz, and you know, the sky's the limit. Yeah. Uh, in, in a way, it might help people uh, be be able to participate who are from far away because um, you don't have to travel to the Midwest. Mm -hmm. um, I I know that we have some presenters that are coming from Australia, New Zealand. Um, I think Phoebe's going to be there. Oh, um, you know, we've already in the Young Basis program, I'm uh, co-chairing that program. We've got um, people from, I think there's somebody from New Zealand that's that's uh, that's applied. Um, and we've got people from all over the place. So we, we hope that, that there'll be more international um, participation. So so I think that's the that's the silver lining of all the the Zoom world that we're going on is is being able to still make connections and and meet meet people in meaningful ways. So. Agreed. Oh yeah, I can't wait. Okay, great. I'll, and I always put I'll put the links and info to that. So because everyone everyone should tune in. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. The young basis uh, application deadline is April the twenty sixth, but we'll still keep taking applications if they. As long as we have space. Mm -hmm. so. Oh, wonderful. All right. <laughs> well, cool. Thank you so much, Tracy. Again, I really appreciate it. And um, I can't wait, wait to meet you in person. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks. So. Bye. Bye. Bye.